Next on Viewpoint. I felt like the earth would open up and swallow me into hell. I had a knife under my pillow. Two people share how they overcame paralyzing fear. And is Jesus the only way into heaven? Nobody else qualifies for that. Buddha doesn't qualify. This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. Later in the show, I speak with a former journalist about the reasons he believes that faith is the only way a person can go to heaven. But first, fear can be a powerful emotion for many of us. It keeps us from danger. But for others, it can be paralyzing. My first guest has devoted his life to bringing peace to others as a pastor. However, one day, in the blink of an eye, fear took over Pastor Nathan Branham's life. That surprised me after meeting you and the joy that's in your yeah. face that you, you had a time in your life when you just felt like all the darkness is closing in and you're in a pit. What, what happened? Yeah, I did, Bob. It was, um, I still remember the day. It was so, so powerful and so terrifying that, you know, it was indelibly imprinted upon my heart. Uh, October 1st, 2004, wow. um, I was at, I'd been in ministry for about four years. I was born again in 1994, so serving so the Lord for years. So you'd been serving the Lord for 10 years. I mean, you knew, yeah. you knew who you were as a child of Absolutely. God. Absolutely. Fear is irrational, right? It, it, mm -hmm. it, it causes you to think things that, that aren't true. Right. And, and so I was at work one day at the mission. I was so in my were, office. you were in missions work at that time. You weren't in, in, I was, involved yeah. in a church. Yeah, I was in missions work. Mm -hmm. And I was in my office, and this, I just thought I was going to die. I mean, it hit your brain or your heart, or how did you feel? Yeah, I, I just felt like I was going to die jumped out of my seat. I ran next door to my coworker and I said, please pray for me. I think I'm going to die. It was terrifying. And then to add insult to injury, I felt like the earth would open up and swallow me into hell. It was, it was terrifying. And uh, so not only that you thought you were going to die, but you thought you'd lost your salvation. I did. Yeah, it, it was, it was uh, beyond terrifying. And uh, he began to pray for me. The prayer was ineffective. I fell to my knees and just began to cry out to God. And uh, the, the feeling subsided. But that was the earthquake, and I would experience over the next four or five years shockwave after shockwave of fear and terror along those same lines. As, and as deep as it was that day, or as, as you pretty like much, it was yeah, it was as deep uh, and as, as as tough as I experienced that day, and uh, it caused me to dig into God's word like I had never done before. So that was your battle plan. I'm going to get into God's word. I mean, it wasn't a matter of. I'm going to go see a psychiatrist or a, a medical doctor, but I mean, did, did you see any doctors who just said, this is my battle plan, I'm going to get into the Word of God here and find out why I'm, th this, this thing has taken over? Yeah, I, I had thought many times, maybe I need to go see a doctor for this, mm -hmm. maybe, I, maybe I need to get on medication, um, but I didn't. And I'm not saying that anyone that deals with this shouldn't do that, I'm mm -hmm. just saying that's not what I did. I believe that if, if we're reading the truth, if that's what it is in the mm -hmm. Bible, that it should be able to diagnose me and then provide a cure or a solution to that problem. And so that's what I did. I dug in and I believe I found the solution. And where did, I mean, was it in one particular scripture that you just grabbed a hold of or was it just throughout the Word of God? Throughout the Word of God, I looked, believe it or not, I went to Job. Who suffered, <laughs> well, who, yeah, there you who go. doesn't go to Job there, in their yeah. difficult times, right? I went to Job and I found out. And for out, those who don't know, I mean, yeah, people that are true. watching. That's true. Job, uh, he, God sort of just gave him over to be tormented in a way. I mean, he was, his friends were tormenting him. His wife was saying, why don't you just give up and die, curse God and die? So Job, was, he's the guy you go to when you say he survived and God blessed him afterwards. That's right. Job went through horrendous suffering, mm -hmm. right? Lost his children. Right. Part of that was he felt like he was forsaken by God. And that was probably the, the, the real right. trial in the But trial. he held on to God anyway. I mean, he thought he was forsaken, but he, he, he did not curse God. No, no he didn't. He was faithful. Mm -hmm. And I felt like, God, I'm going through this. I'm going to hold on to my faith, and I'm not mm -hmm. going to let you go. Uh, Job said in John 13, 15, he said, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him, and I'll maintain my ways before him. So think about that. Job was saying, even though God, in, in, at that point he was perceiving it was God and most of it was Satan, but mm -hmm. anyway, he perceived that it was God that, that was tormenting him. And so it wasn't God that was tormenting him, it was, it was, it was Satan at the time. It right? was Satan, absolutely, yeah. yeah. And uh, God knew the work that he had done in Job's life. Mm -hmm. And you know, through that time of suffering, 
I really had a lot of questions like, God, why are you letting me go through this? Uh, if I'm saved, why am I experiencing this? Those were the real big questions for me that I had to answer. Now you said these, these things would come in waves, or there'd be these aftershocks yes. of this fear. During the time in between and the intermittent time, was there a depression? Was there any feeling that it was going to come back? Was there a, even a fear that it would reoccur? So fear on top of fear. Um, you know what, there was, but there was also relief. Like, my Lord, I'm just thankful to be free mm -hmm. from that overwhelming fear. How did it finally just go away? It's gone now. It's gone now, yeah. How, how did you finally wake up one morning and say, wow, God's brought me through it? Yeah, I, I believe that I really grew through that. Mm -hmm. So in other words, I, my faith got to the point in the Word of God that took me out of the reach of that overwhelming fear. And there's fears. I mean, people suffer from fears of, I mean, and some are very, very real, fear of spiders. Mm -hmm. My wife hates spiders. Yeah, she sure. can play with mice, but she hates spiders. But there's fear of snakes and all kinds of fears like that. But this is a different thing. This is really an, an attack yes. of, of the enemy. Yeah, that's right. You know, fear is incapacitating. Mm -hmm. uh, First John says that fear has torment, right? Fear is tormenting. And those right. that fear are not made perfect in love. So in the process of the believer growing in faith, um, we're going to have to confront fear, and then we're going to have to overcome it. Yeah, if someone's suffering from that now, and I'm, I'm talking about deep anxiety attacks, either they're, they're, they're afraid that they've lost their salvation, they've done something they can't be forgiven for, or they're real anxiety attacks, and there's something maybe chemically going on in their brain, or there's something psychologically going on. What can, you, what can you speak to them right now? I'd give them three things. Mm -hmm. First is their faith. That they need to dig into God's okay. word. Is, is if, if they're, even yeah. if they're, if they're non-Christian. Yeah. Wh where do they start? Yeah, I, I think that they need to realize that there is something greater and higher than them. Mm -hmm. We know that to be God, right? right? And that they have a purpose. I would encourage them. This is, this is like Hello. God knocking at the door yeah. of their heart. Like, listen, mm -hmm. I'm here. I'm here and I want to help you. So faith would be my first right. piece of advice. The second would be family. Reaching out mm -hmm. to those around you, getting different opinions, getting thoughts, getting help, getting encouragement, and, and see that you can, you're not in this right. alone. A and lot if, of times we feel like we are, but we're not. And if the fear is coming from the family, I mean, it may be causing the fear in some people's lives is their, uh, their relationships, to find someone else who's going who's gonna to invest in their life and listen to them. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think mentorship would help. Um, mm -hmm. uh, talking to a local pastor, being talking to someone that's gone through this. Yeah, being accountable. What's, what's one, one promise that God made you, that you found in his word, that he made you during that time? 2 Corinthians 1.5 mm -hmm. says that we experience the suffering of Christ, but it's for others. Out of this entire mm -hmm. journey of fear, I realized that what I was experiencing was the suffering of Christ. Right. Think about all that Jesus encountered and all that he mm -hmm. suffered. Probably the greatest piece of his suffering was when he was on the cross and he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And, and as believers, mm -hmm we will more than likely, at one time or another, have to feel that. But here's, here's what happens. When we use our faith to reach through the fear and take a hold of God, that means that we, we get in connection with hope, love, joy, peace, all of those things. We find that it couldn't have been without that suffering. Right. What, would you give that up now? Would you take that out of your resume? You know what, if you were to ask me that right when I was in the midst of it, I'd say, just get me out of this. I never yeah. want to experience that again. But looking back on it, I wouldn't change a thing. It's made you who you are today. It is. Yeah. Speak to that person right now that, that they're, they're saying, yeah, I, I, I can relate to what he's, what he's been through. Would you pray for them? Absolutely. Would you do that? Yeah. Thank you. So, Father, we come before you now in Jesus' name. And, Lord, I'm thinking of that one right now who is so desperate, who is hurting. Their hearts are broken. All they see is darkness all about them. God, I'm asking in Jesus' name right now that you would break the powers of darkness, that you would deliver them of this overwhelming, controlling fear. You promised that you haven't given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. God, fear has torment, but you are the God of love. And so, God, I'm asking right now that you would deliver this one. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. After the break. I had a knife under my pillow because I was just so afraid to get up and move. I was completely paralyzed. This woman will share how she overcame fear after a violent attack when we return.
Fear can be a paralyzing emotion that can trap anyone at any time. Monica Guidry is an author and worship leader, and she had to face fear head on in a battle for her life. Monica joins us today from her home in Columbus, Ohio. Thanks, Monica. I appreciate it. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Monica, you're a wife and a mother of two, and life seemed pretty normal until one afternoon when terror struck you and your home. Tell me what happened. So it was a normal day. I and my children were home and my son was downstairs and I started to hear noises coming from my son's room and it sounded like um, some crackling, crackling noises. So I went back into the computer room and I started hearing noises again and this time it sounded like someone was throwing rocks at my oldest son's window. And so I got up again and I go to the steps and I look down and I don't see my son. And as I'm turning around to come up the stairs, a man jumps out. I noticed that the man that had jumped out had a knife over his head. Were you in shock or did you think this was going to be a life and death situation, life and death struggle that may involve your kids who at the time were very, very young? It took a minute for me to process. I know that's going to sound weird. It took a minute for me to process that this was really happening. So what happened next was I, I began to tell him that he could leave, you know, just go leave us alone. He could go and I wouldn't report him or anything like that. But he had other plans. He said no. And I had to start um, defending myself because he started cutting and stabbing at me and I was defending myself. I was trying to block him. And at some point we wrestled and I fell to the ground and he was hovering over me with the knife. And I'm, I'm fighting as best as I could. And my doorbell rang. And as soon as my doorbell rang, I just thought to myself, I've got to get down to the door. If I could just get down to the door. And as he's cutting and slicing and he's saying, die. And then that's just when I started really really with all of my might fighting back. I literally just started fighting back and I got up, I was able to get up and I was able to take the knife from him. So I took the knife from him and I'm holding it at him at this point and backing down the steps to my door. And as soon as I got to the door, I opened it up and a man was standing there and I just got hysterical. Like there's a man, he broke into my house and he's trying to assault me. I don't know how this man got from the top of my steps down to the bottom. It was like he flew down the steps and out my back door. And the man chased after him, but they never caught him. That, that had to be absolutely terrifying, but it sounds like a miracle that you weren't really killed or even badly wounded. The God thing about all of this is that I have a couple of scratches on my arms, but nothing else. My dress, the dress that I was wearing that day has, you could, it, I kept it for a while, but it has slices in it from the knife, but nothing penetrated. Now I should add that the police never did find the man who broke into your home and threatened you. They never found the guy, and which was the reason why I was afraid. I was afraid because they never found him and he could have easily come, came back and finished, finished the job that he started. Well then the next day, how did you plan to face this new fear you were confronting? You were back on your own again. It dawned on me um, that night, and it was when I was lying in bed next to my husband, and um, I had a knife under my pillow. Now, I know that my husband would protect me with all of his might, but that wasn't security enough for me. So I had this knife tucked underneath my pillow just in case, and I remember not sleeping at all, but just staring up at the ceiling. I didn't even go to the restroom in between the night because I was just so afraid to get up and move. I was completely paralyzed. This shook my faith and it did in a sense because it developed something in me that I had not had before, which was a spirit of fear. The next morning I planned, had my bags packed at the door to go over a friend's house because I was a stay at home mother. So I was not working during the, at that time. I was getting ready to leave out of the door to go to this arrangement with me being at my friend's house and Holy Spirit stopped me and said, no, you're not going anywhere. And because I'm an obedient servant most of the time, I put my bags down, I unlatched my daughter from her car seat and we stayed at the house. I didn't go anywhere. So you had one day that fear took over your life. Uh, did fear ever, ever return? The first day was the, the last day. 
that I let that consume me, fear consume me. So this is what happened. I stayed home and I went through my home and I just began to pray over my house and um, prayed over every window and every door and through every room um, and basically dispelled fear. Well, Monica, explain to the folks watching in our audience who maybe are not familiar with why you believe that speaking out and declaring what you believe was an important part of removing the fear. I believe in the power of words and declaration. Why? Because our whole world was formed with words. God spoke it and it was. And so I believe that there are times where we have to declare and speak things audibly in order for things to happen. Now, now I know you're saying you dealt with it head on, but I have to assume there are moments when fear confronts you. How do you deal with it when it comes back? Of course, of course fear pops up. But for me, what I do is I weigh it out. Is this fear, am I afraid or am I unsettled? So when I feel like I'm afraid, I know that I'm afraid because it's paralyzing. Fear always will paralyze you. Fear will always paralyze you. It will stop you in your tracks and stop you from moving forward. Being unsettled is just a feeling that you have, but you're still able to move. So when I feel fear, that's when I decide I'm going to face this thing head on and just go for it. Um, so yes, fear comes up every now and again, and I'll, I have to just shut it down instantly because I've decided that that's not something that I'm going to operate in. Well, for people out there, where, where in the Bible do you feel a person needs to turn to if they're really dealing with real fear right now? I would absolutely go to the scripture that says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. Clearly in that scripture it says he has not given that to us. He's not given that to us. So if we have it, we know that it has not come from our heavenly father. Well, Monica, thanks. Thank you for sharing your viewpoint and for sharing your story with us today. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Nobody under the side of my voice has to go to hell. If anybody, if you go to hell, it's because you choose to. A former journalist will share his viewpoint of why he believes there is only one way into heaven. Next. For many years, we've seen it on signposts on the, in the highway. We've, we've heard, read it in books, but Jesus saves. And what does he save us from? And our Christians so narrow-minded that we think that Jesus really is the only way to eternal life. Well, with me is Bill Harris. Bill, you've been a TV journalist. You've been a teacher. You've done a lot of things in your life, but you've, you've believed that Jesus Christ really saves. Amen. What does he save us from? He saves us from our sins. We, we, we seem not to understand sometimes that because of the sin of our forefathers, Adam and Eve, that sin was like a disease, so to speak. It just spread throughout the whole human race, meaning that now judgment and punishment await all of humanity, except for the fact that Jesus stepped in and took the punishment from us and for us. Why did it have to be Jesus? See, God in his own infinite wisdom could not send a choice angel. He could not send a regular human being. It had, to be, it had to be a special sacrifice that met God's specifications or qualifications. And the only one who qualified was his own son. So he pulled his own son out of his bosom and sent him down. And he, he, he died first. Now, he, here's the point. While he was on that cross, Bob, remember this, that when God looked down on him, he no longer saw his son. What he saw was the flesh of the prostitute, the flesh of the drug addict, the flesh of the alcoholic, the flesh of the schizophrenic, the flesh of the mentally retarded, the flesh of the white beater. He saw your flesh. He saw my so flesh. All the sickness, so all the disease, all, all the all sin that is hanging on. Hanging on Jesus because all of that was imputed to him. And because God is offended by sin, God turned his back on his own son. I mean, God the Father and God the Holy Spirit stepped back and left Jesus to die alone. That's why Jesus said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The desertion was real because God is offended by sin. So he, he became the living sacrifice there on that cross, but it didn't end there. Upon his death, he went down into the grave and he suffered the full assault of hell. All that you and I yeah. would go through in hell, he went through it 
for those three See, days. That's one thing we, we very seldom talk about is, is we, we kind of end it with the, the cross and then begin it again with resurrection. Ah. But there was, there, was, not only, there was three days. In he that. not only died for you, he went to hell oh. for you. Nobody under the side of my voice has to go to hell. If anybody, if you go to hell, it's because you choose to. Mm -hmm. You don't have to because Jesus is the only one who qualified himself by the way he died, qualified himself to be the only way. But there's that, there's that good person living out there. Mm -hmm. They have been mm -hmm. good all their life. Yes. They've never, they know offended anybody. And if yeah. they did, they asked, but they've never imputed, the, I mean, they've never received Jesus Christ yeah. as Lord and Savior. Now, is God going to send them to hell or has he just provided this very narrow road that they can, are they on their way there? Yeah, that's an excellent question. We get asked this all the time. Even though that person is, quote unquote, a good person, as mm -hmm. we're calling it, let's understand that person has the nature of sin. As I mentioned earlier, because of the sin of Adam and Eve, that that sinful nature and death coming with it mm -hmm. le leads to the condemnation of that person. If they knowingly reject Jesus Christ and do not and do not want the message that is telling them that even though you are a good person, you're still not good enough without Christ because of all that Christ went through for you. God will never negate what Christ went through to allow people to get to him. This is why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man cometh to the father, but by me. Jesus is the gatekeeper. So there's not a lot of roads out there. I mean, if we're there a very a good person roads, and right. I worship the trees and I love the earth, I mean, it's yeah, it, it, there's not it, a lot of roads. And the reason, the reason God made it so narrow is not that God is narrow-minded, per se, in the negative sense that we think about. It is the fact that God doesn't want you to miss it. This is the only road of salvation. This is the only plan of salvation. Mm -hmm. Remember, God is a planner. He has a plan for your life, but he also has a plan of salvation. And this is the only plan that God set up. He did not set up multiple plans in multiple ways. Mm -hmm. He wants everybody to come through his son. And even in the final analysis, when we get to the end of this world, all things are going to be under Jesus Christ mm -hmm. because he qualified himself mm -hmm. by becoming human. He was God, the son in heaven. He took off his royal robe, Bob, and put on a robe of flesh and went through the school of humanity for 33 years so that he could be touched with the feelings of your infirmities. Mm -hmm. Nobody else qualifies for that. Buddha doesn't qualify. Mm -hmm. Confucius doesn't qualify. Nobody else qualifies because they have not, and he died. And not only that, Jesus is the only God who predicted his own death and resurrection and pulled it off. <laughs> no other God has ever happened done just that. just like he said. Yes, happened just like he said. The Bible is also a history book, mm -hmm. right? Three so, 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 we, so we know Jesus is in there, and this is, he's a person, and he was crucified. So I, can I just believe, I, I believe that Jesus is there. Do I believe in him like I believe in this table? I mean, I see them both, yeah. I, I, but, but how do I really believe? What, what yeah, is the difference between this table's not going to save me? That's right. So what's the difference in those two beliefs? Well, it, 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 the key word is belief because we are asked to believe a God that we cannot see mm -hmm. because God is a God of faith and all that he does is based on faith. I mean, think about this world. When, when, when he brought this world into, into existence, it was by faith. He simply spoke it. And the world came into being. God is a God of faith. And when he was dealing with the disciples, remember Thomas was not there when yeah. Jesus came mm -hmm. back after the resurrection. Jesus made a special trip to come back with so Thomas. Thomas could see. Yeah, so he could see him say, you know, to, to touch the nail, nail prints in my hand and, my, and the, the, the wound in my side and the like. And, but he said, blessed are those who have not seen and still believe mm -hmm. because God operates on faith and he wants us right. to be the same way. When you sit down in this chair, you don't sit to look and say, well, is this chair going to hold me up? You just sit in it by faith. You just, hey, it's going to hold me up. God wants simplistic faith to be operated on our part. That sounds, that may sound like very far-fetched, but God is a God of faith. We are, we are to love him even though we haven't seen him. Okay, and there, there's somebody out there right now that's saying that, that sounds pretty far-fetched to me. Mm -hmm. they, they know about Jesus. They've heard about him along with Confucius and everybody else. They're saying, okay. I, I'm hearing what you're saying, Bill, 
uh, how, how do I how do I make this belief real in my life? How do I make that faith come alive in my life? Would you would you speak to them and sure. and, and and show them what they need, what sure. they need to do? I would say that for anybody that that is out there, no matter what your situation, no matter what your background, no matter what color you are, <laughs> what side of the tracks you were born on, it doesn't matter. All you need to do is acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior and that he died for you and that you want to accept him now as your Lord and Savior. And if you just repeat this simple prayer, it's, it's, we call it the sinner's prayer in, in Christianity. You say, Lord, I am a sinner. Please forgive me for my sins. I acknowledge that you died and rose again for me. And now I accept you as my Lord and Savior, and I will live for you from this time forward. Amen. And you just became a born-again Christian. It's just that simple. When you confess and you really mean it in your heart, that's all it takes, Bob. That's all it takes. And they, and they, they move on with their life from there? or yeah. they? I would suggest, I recommend, as I used to do on my program all the time, that you get into a good Bible-believing church mm -hmm. so that you can be taught so that you can learn how to grow in this new Christian walk that you've just taken on. If you'd like more information about Jesus Christ or how to connect to a local church, go to our website or Facebook page. We have a lot more resources there that we can connect you with. I'm Bob Placey. Thank you for joining us for Viewpoint today.